<laughs> Sorry about this. So my name is Adrian Sturm, and I'm indeed from Leiden. Um, so today I will talk about um, the pebble drift and trapping, um, and really tracing this with astrochemistry. And this is a very exciting field. Um, star formation actually starts in the densest and coldest clouds in the Milky Way. And when these clouds collapse, they end up in a, as a perfect planetary disk because of the conservation of angular momentum. And in these disks, some planets will be formed. And in the end, we end up with a solar system like our own, uh, and potentially some planets and life. And I'm particularly interested in this step, how we get from a protoplanetary disk to planets, and how we get molecules actually from those protoplanetary disks to planets. And the key role plays carbon, because we cannot imagine life without carbon. It is a backbone of many biomolecules. And besides of that, it regulates the chemistry and planetary atmospheres. Think of the CO2 and methane that regulates the temperature on Earth. And we think that carbon is brought to Earth as ice. But until we get the data from JWST, we can't observe the ice directly. And for that reason, we have to look into the deficit in the gas, basically. So, and I can already spoil, spoil that some disks are actually trapping carbon-rich ices. But before I go into that detail, I have to explain how gas depletion works. So gas depletion basically means that you remove some of the molecules from the gas and place it on ices on dust grains. Okay, imagine you have a star with a disk around it and just due to the temperature of the star and the UV irradiation from the star and other stars, you get this temperature gradient both in radial and vertical direction. And you get this cold region where molecules like CO, the most common molecule besides H2, um, CO can freeze out in this region. Okay, and that is basically the whole chemistry of CO. It's a pretty basic molecule. It can um, be destroyed by UV radiation and neutral carbon and oxygen, and it can freeze out in colder regions. And those are the three flavors of carbon, actually. Um, so the, the most abundant uh, CO molecule. But there's another process going on in protoplanetary disk, and that is dust grain processing. So small dust grains will eventually grow to larger grains, especially when you have ices that um, could help stick the grains together. And once a grain actually grows, it decouples from the gas um, because it's moving at capillarian speeds, or at least it wants to um, travel at capillarian speeds, but the gas is moving slightly slower because of the gas, the gas pressure. And because of this, we get dust settling because there's a, that is energetically favorable, and we get radial drift of the larger dust particles. Okay, so those are two separate things. But if we combine these two, then you can see that we move carbon on ices in midplane, but we move the carbon from the outer disk towards the inner disk. So we basically re we remove this part from the equilibrium. And this basically means that you cycle all your carbon through the midplane and remove it from the gas. Um, and it, it becomes ice on the brains. And eventually it end, ends up in the in a disk where it will sublimate again because the temperatures are getting warmer. And you will end up with something like this. Here I plot the carbon abundance as a function of radius. So in the outer disk, we expect a depletion by a factor of 10 or even 100. And in the inner disk, we expect um, more CO because it is released from the, the grains. Unless we have dust traps. Okay, so on the left, I show here the figure that I painted before. So we, if you have volatile release, then the volatiles freeze out and dust grains move to the inner disk. We get a lot of CO in the inner disk. But if you have dust locking, for example, by a dust trap formed by another planet or an instability in the disk, then the CO cannot move to the inner disk, but it still um, depletes from the outer disk. And another uh, possibility is rapid planetesimal formation because planetesimal formation planetesimals are really decoupled from the gas at all um, so they don't move in to the star so co remains in the outer disk 
So previously we have had a nice study towards the inner disk. So these are neutral carbon lines and they really target the gas accretion column. And we actually see that the carbon abundance is very low in the inner disk. And this is interesting because that could either mean that this might be true, so that there is planetesimal formation going on in the system, or that there is just a lot more depletion in the outer disk than we think. But until now, we don't know um, what the carbon abundance is in the outer disk. So for that reason, we conducted a um, small study, seven sources in Taurus. So this is uh, using the ACA band eight. Um, and we target the neutral carbon line at uh, about 500 gigahertz. And we trace the really cold gas. So this is basically the bulk of the disk mass. And this line is very sensitive to the carbon abundance in protoplanetary disk. So you can see that most of the disks are actually unresolved. There is some substructure to, some substructure to be seen due to info and um, envelope material. And you can see a lot of substructure in the spectrum as well. So in DO tau, for example, this outflow is associated with an outflow that's also seen in 12CO. And in DO tau, we see some signatures of info. Um, and we use DALI, a physical chemical code, to basically get the carbon abundance from the total line flux. Um, so I'll get, go straight to the results. Um, and I will show that in such a plot. So on the x-axis, I show the radius in the protoplanetary disk. So we have basically two points, the inner disk, which is in the accreting column, really close to the, to the star, 0.1 AU. And we have the outer disk, so that is really um, 10 to 1,000 AU, something like that. So on top, we have high carbon abundance. Here is the ISM level. And on the bottom, we have a low carbon abundance. So we spend almost two orders of magnitude, right? So if we plot the three sources um, that we modeled, uh, the other four sources were contaminated too much with the uh, with the cloud. So um, we focused on these three sources, and we can see that there is a lot of carbon depletion for all the sources, and this is already interesting because that means that there is a lot of carbon-rich ice forming on the grains. And if we add some other sources where we know the carbon abundance in the outer disk, for example, TW Hydra we can see that there is an evolutionary trend for the carbon depletion over time. So TW Hydra and DL Tau are both pretty old, um, 10 mega years old, something like that. DL Tau and DL Tau are much younger, one to two mega years old. And class zero, class one sources, so the sources sometimes even without the disk, the very young sources where it's start just as formed, we don't see any signatures of carbon abundance at all. And this is mainly a temperature effect. So in these old sources, we get that carbon is frozen out on dust grains and moved to the inner disk, right? But if you have younger sources, we get a lot of UV irradiation and the disks are in general much warmer. So the region where CO can freeze out is much smaller. So over time, you increase the region where CO can freeze out and you increase also the level of carbon depletion. Another exception to this, are actually warmer sources. So if you have a very hot star in the center, then the region is also much smaller where carbon can freeze out or CO can freeze out. And we can see that in these two herbic stars that have very similar depletion as DR tau, a very young source, but these herbic stars are actually quite old. They are older than TW hydra and DL tau. But because they are that warm, they don't have that much depletion. But what about the dust transport? If we have radial drift, so in this case, and we see a lot of CO in the inner disk, we would see something like this in this plot, right? We have a lot of depletion in the outer disk, and we see a lot of the CO back in the inner disk. If we have dust locking, then we would expect something like this. So we have depletion in the outer disk, but we see very similar depletion in the inner disk because it is, the carbon is trapped in the outer disk. And if we look at DL tau, one of the sources that we analyzed, we can see that there is a lot of radial drift. And this is actually interesting because we know that DL tau has a lot of substructure in uh, the disk. So there are two or three rings. And usually those rings are thought to trap 
dust. Um, so this either means that those dust traps are leaky. So some of the dust can actually go through the gaps um, and still accrete onto the star. Or it could mean that the traps are formed late. So the material that is now falling onto the star had crossed the position where the trap has formed before the trap had formed. And these are millions of years ago that the material was there actually because the traps are that far out. Because otherwise, only 60% of the material is trapped in these dust rings, which is very low. TW Hydra and the Herbic star shows very similar signatures. Um, but say TW Hydra has much less radial drift, probably because of the cavity in the inner disk. So DO tau and DO tau are actually pretty flat profile, which is interesting because those are the very compact sources. And usually we think, okay, these are compact sources. Those are boring because we can't resolve it that much because we have only a few beams across. We don't see any substructures. So often we skip these targets in large surveys. We focus on the D-sharp images, for example, where we have a lot of substructure. But we see actually that there is a lot, a lot of um, dust trapping going on in these systems. And this could either mean that there is a very rapid planetesimal formation or that there is substructure in the disk that is unresolved. Um, so we need to study these compact objects in the future with ALMA and also resolve them to see what is going on in the systems because those, are, those might be the most interesting to look at. So in the future, we want to add more points, for example, by using resolved on the data. And with that, we can actually uh, add some points in the middle disk. Um, we can also add more points in the outer disk and see if this evolutionary trend holds or if there is some other process that we still don't understand that starts stirring this thing up. And we would also like to in the involve G the JWST and Cryos Plus because um, with that, we can look at the terrestrial uh, region um, where we think Earth has formed and life has originated. So those are um, the interesting places to look at. And with this detailed radio profile, we can actually pinpoint where exactly in the disk the carbon is uh, located. So with that, I leave you with the conclusions. So we see that neutral carbon in the outer disk is a very good tracer of the elemental carbon abundance in the bulk of the gas. And we modeled three t Tauri sources that are all depleted in carbon. And we see that the amount of carbon depletion in the outer disk increases over time, um, mostly due to the temperature effect. And in the end, we find um, radial drift in the tau, which points at leaky dust traps or at um, late form dust traps. And we find that there is a lot of carbon rich ice uh, locking in the compact disks of DR Tau and DR Tau. So thanks for your attention and happy to take any questions. Thank you. You are perfect on time. Very exciting uh, talk. I appreciate uh, very much the, your review on CO gas depletion processes. I'm not on the field, but it was very clear. Thank you. We have already some uh, questions for, for you. Sebastian, you would like to read them or I can read? Yes, um, a question from the chat. So thank you for the very nice and clear talk. <clears throat> but due to the limited angular resolution, what was the method used to distinguish between inner and outer disk emission of carbon? That's a good question. Um, so the inner disk, region is emitting at completely different wavelengths because it is that much warmer. So for that, you have to use a completely different telescope, not ELMA in this that line. So if we see the neutral carbon line in the band 8 ELMA observations, then we know that it is out of disk, either out of disk or some signature of infall, outfall or uh, cloud contamination. And infall, outfall, you can really distinguish in your spectrum. Um, because we know that a disk has Keplerian rotation, so we expect a nice profile that we can fit based on the continuum observations and everything that doesn't match that profile is uh, outfall or infall. So it, it is a puzzle to, to distinguish 
between the disk and the outfall, but not between the inner disk and the outer disk. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I ask another question? So, yeah. um, so based on your work and results, would you say that all stars are going to have planets formed? Is it a fundamental law in nature that all uh, protoplanetary disks are going to form star, uh, planets? I don't think it's a fundamental uh, physical law, but we see that around actually all, the whole population of, of stars that we know um, have planets around them because we have found them using uh, uh, other surveys. Um, and this study actually shows that um, the, the compact objects where we don't see any planets might be forming planets as well. So I don't think that we can say that they, there has to be forming planets around every star, but it is quite likely that most of the stars do actually because we see so many planets around uh, around stars, yeah. Do we have time for one more question? Or? Yes, yes, we have time. Okay. What was the motivation to use ACA instead of ALMA? Was it due to some particular reason or? That is a good question. Um, it is band eight and band eight is hard to observe anyway. So uh, for this, we already had to, uh, to use quite some time on the, on the ACA and it is a quite weak line, but we really wanted to target neutral carbon because we know that CO is depleted, so it's it's hard to look at CO directly. Um, so we use ACA because of sensitivity and because we don't really need uh, the, the, the resolution. So it would be nice if we could resolve it because you get you would get more points radially, but it would take a lot more time. So that would take easily for five hours per source and we could have only done one source maybe uh, in, in the same time um, as we did seven now. Could I ask the sensitivity of, of your observation? Just to have an idea. If you remember. I don't know at the top of my head, but I think it's 0.1 Jensky, something like that. I have to look it up. It's, it's in the paper, so you can go to the paper and uh, look it up. Yeah. So are, are you planning also to model the other uh, four uh, sources you have in the sample? Um, Probably one of the sources um, we, we can actually model and determine the carbon abundance in the outer disk. The other two are much more difficult because they are so contaminated with the uh, the inflow and the, the out, out, outflow signatures that we can't distinguish what is. Uh, I can go to that slide actually. Um, yeah, if you, if you look at these sources in Chameleon, you can see that it is hard, very hard to distinguish what is, what is disk and what not. In FM chart, for example, this might be the Chameleon part that we want to look at, and the other stuff is outflow. But at that point, it becomes very tricky to determine what the total line flux is that is coming that is coming from the disk itself, and not from the material around it. So these sources we can model. FC tau is not non detection, so we can go for AS two or five. Um, but that's it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. A, a, a quick one, maybe, or yes, we have, we have one minute. <laughs> okay. Just have a question about the orientation of the disk. Is it a problem if you don't know really the orientation, or because you install the inner outer part with this kinematic? So if your orientation maybe this can be a problem or not? Uh, we know the orientation based on uh, CO data and continuum observations. So we have quite high angular resolution observations of these disks and continuum. So we know the orientation of the disk and that helps a lot in modeling sources. So you are very clever to replace the brute resolution with uh, adding extra information from other things. Okay. That's yeah, good. exactly. Very good. Very good. Thanks. Okay, thank you. We, we have to pass to the other speaker. Uh, thank you very much. And if you have other questions, please write in the Slack channel.